So welcome back everybody to this conference. This is when we switch to English. So the first talk is in English and the rest of the conference will be in French. Donc on passe à l'anglais pour juste la, cette intervention et ensuite on revient à la langue française. So this is uh, our speakers are Philip Cartwright, who's a, a professor of economics, moving on to a different career, <laughs> if I may say so. He's also a musician. He uh, teaches at uh, Paris School of Business, uh, but he's also affiliated with the Royal College of Music. Uh, and his uh, partner for this talk is Ekaterina Besson, who is also uh, a teacher at PSB, and she specializes in uh, innovation management uh, create, and looks at creativity and consumption of um, um, technological or information, if I'm, if I'm right. So um, thank you for your talk. The title is here. Now we're going to talk about music and dance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I hope you enjoy what Katya and I have to tell you about uh, the music and the dance industries. Uh, I want to recognize up front uh, the fact that uh, Asia Kafi and uh, Maya Charani uh, were involved in the project uh, in different points. Uh, Asia doing some uh, computational work for us and uh, Maya early on in helping us with the survey. For my part, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the industries initially, and then I'd like to move on and talk about some specifics as concerns the individuals in those industries and some of the psychology which is associated with the artists and the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, this research falls into a broader uh, tableau for me because it, it comes into line with a lot of the work that's being done at the Royal College of Music and the Center for Performance Science, of which I'm a part. So I've fallen in with a group of cognitive psychologists, and this is the outcome. I start looking at people for their profiles and what they're doing and how they respond to various stimuli and things like that. So on the production side, the supply side of music and dance, I think it goes without saying that whether you're talking about music or you're talking about dance, uh, the effects, particularly for live entertainment, were devastating for both music and dance. Live performance basically came off the table. And depending upon where you fall in the industry, you either survived with a safety net or you had other opportunities, or unfortunately some people had to drop out completely. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I also want to recognize the fact that there were many people that contributed to the study on my side, uh, many people that were involved in the interview process. And I can't list them all, but uh, these are people, the people that I've listed, uh, Olivia Boisson, New, uh, New York City Ballet, Skylar Brandt at American Ballet Theater, um, the whole group, uh, Maron Curry at the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. There were a number of people that made significant contributions, not only uh, by way of what they told me about their impressions, their behaviors, their understanding of uh, opportunities in the COVID environment, but they also introduced me to many people, many people with phenomenal talent, um, which brings me to another point, And that is, I wanna make it clear that as I talk about my observations, this is not a representative sample by any means. Uh, the people with whom I spoke are at the top of their game basically. So on the dance side, for the most part, these are principal dancers in the various global companies and the musicians as well are either, um, one person is a principal uh, violinist with the New York City Ballet, principal cellist with the New York City uh, Ballet Orchestra, uh, and uh, a couple of people with the Metropolitan uh, Opera Orchestra, which is many, many of you know is 
uh, the creme de la creme as far as uh, operas and orchestras are concerned. Briefly, as far as the music industry goes, while live entertainment uh, was absolutely devastated, as were many of the artists, music was able to carry its own to some extent based on recorded music and streaming. And it, the, the data, the most recent data show that there was actually growth in the industry, but it's all accountable. Uh, it's accountable to the fact that there was recorded music sales and, and streaming. And streaming, in fact, at least in some genre, uh, became increasingly popular. And some of the other genre, classical music being one, it didn't seem to make much difference. People that listen to classical music, Spotify, and listen to um, Tchaikovsky, still listen to Tchaikovsky with Spotify. Um, some of the more popular genre, popular music, did show increases during during the COVID. Well, and, um, <laughs> as of today, uh, that that's true. So there will be some structural shifts in music, but they won't be as dramatic as they might be in some of the other performing arts, uh, because online streaming has been around longer. People are more familiar with it. It is often, as you know, uh, taken on a subscription basis. Um, so we generally anticipate that while there was a slowdown, we should see the market return to where it was in 2015, uh, which was a good year. Uh, it, should re it should rebound fairly quickly once we uh, actually get the uh, pandemic uh, behind us. I want to talk just a little bit more about the music industry and individuals. My colleagues at the Royal College of Music uh, did a two-part study. It's part of a much larger um, study that they're doing about health and well-being of musicians. But they did a study which focused specifically on COVID and the pandemic. And it was a two-part two -part study. The first part uh, was based on what I would say, although it was face-to-face, -face, it was very conventional survey format where yes, no, or one to five kind of a thing. And as I reviewed that study, uh, it showed that, in fact, as you would expect amongst musicians, um, many of them, a majority of them, reported some hardship due to lack of income. Uh, they re reported uh, a significant number, 85% reported that they experienced uh, increased anxiety on a fairly regular basis. And... 63% uh, uh, reported that they had issues related to loneliness, and Katia will talk a bit about that in uh, the study that uh, we've done, the survey study. Um, it turns out that 61% um, um, looked for outside support uh, for financing, uh, and Interestingly, only 45% of the people surveyed in the music community reached out for uh, support in the health and well being area. And this is particularly interesting when you contrast it with the dance community. Um, and I'll, I've got a spider diagram at the end of this that'll show you some of the differences. And again, they're not representative, but I think they're indicative of what you might expect. Um, the study too was, uh, study two was based on interviews. So uh, respondents were able to express themselves in their own words at reasonable length. Um, again, lost or uncertain income was an issue. Um, many of the musicians reported struggles working at home. Um, there was concern over skill maintenance, although musicians less so than dancers because they're able to practice in their own environment, obviously. Uh, however, however, uh, even some of the very, very good musicians that I interviewed admitted to slipping in their practice. Uh, and it was kind of a downward spiral. The, uh, oh, you know, I don't need to practice today. I'll do it tomorrow. Ah, you know, tomorrow comes, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, 
and so forth and so on. So there was some concern about loss of uh, for the string players dexterity and so forth. Uh, and they reflected that. Um, there was a considerable concern about reduced social connections and camaraderie with their colleagues. And interestingly enough, I, only in the last months have I received reports of musicians collaborating online. Uh, it's becoming more popular, but it poses certain um, technical difficulties like latency and so forth and so on. So unless you have some financial support to make that work out, <laughs> it, uh, it, it can be difficult. So there was, there was some concern about loss of camaraderie, loss of collaboration, although I think that that situation has improved. Um, there were continued reports of uh, detrimental effects on health and well-being. Anxiety is an ongoing theme that uh, we heard over and over again. Uh, poor physical health um, and certainly lack of motivation, as I said, this uh, idea that uh, practice, uh, practice regimens started to slip. Um, there were a number of musicians that reported less anxiety and less concern about the fact that they couldn't perform live, but that's due to the fact that many of the musicians that I um, interviewed, they're at the top of their game, and I said, they're on labels such as Deutsche Grammophon and the like, and uh, some of them are Juilliard, so they're performing with people like Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe and so forth. They're not really suffering financially, but they do suffer psychologically. There are some pretty heavy uh, effects related to anxiety and uh, insomnia, that kind of thing. Um, so um, talking now specifically about the dance community and what I found in interviewing them, uh, the overview is that many of the dancers expressed an urgency for change in their industry. Uh, they wanted decisive change, but they didn't know exactly what that change was all about. Uh, there was a concern over changes that would take place in uh, dance organizations, um, the direction, and there was an overriding statement that if the industry continues on its current trajectory, they will return to a state where uh, revenues are a big concern. Uh, there are existential threats to some of the organizations, including some of the world's leading organizations, uh, American Ballet Theater, for example. Uh, and the dancers expressed um, their their motivation was good. Motivation amongst dancers was generally good. And there was a point made over and over again that if one focuses on alternative opportunities uh, and actually following through with them, uh, the effects of the uh, pandemic were mitigated to some extent. Um, is there anything else I need to say about that? Um, no, I think that's experience experience based uh, action uh, and doing other things other than dance. One thing that did come through, I will say on that, um, you know, unlike most of the musicians I interviewed have a relatively long uh, trajectory as far as their career is concerned. I mean, you can be 75 years old and still play um, your instrument. Um, on average, and I, I made, I asked, on average, the uh, lifespan of a dancer in these companies is something on the order of um, um, 10 to 18 seasons at best. And as a consequence of that, um, a considerable amount of concern was expressed on both the high end with respect to age and the low end. On the high end, there are many dancers in world's leading companies that will not return. That is to say, because of a two-year layoff, they're over the age where 
they can dance effectively. There's also a big problem at the lower end because uh, in New York, for example, SAB has not been able to train young dancers as they would have liked. So, I mean, you know, and I'm not trying to be cute. There's a concern about who's going to be in the Nutcracker next year because their young dancers aren't ready to go. Um, I found that particularly interesting. Um, the idea that digital has become increasingly important and um, dance is behind music with respect to digital. There's no question about that. But dancers have found their way to digital. And if you go on Instagram, for example, and I'll, uh, if you, talk, if you uh, search for Skylar Brandt or Tyler Peck, um, uh, Indiana, Woodward, uh, and so forth, you'll find that they're offering online ballet classes, uh, Pilates, uh, general exercise classes on an ongoing basis. And they're doing that with considerable success. So dancers individually have found success with digital and their companies have found some success with digital and ABT in particular uh, has the ABT incubator where they actually, they put their dancers in bubbles. Uh, and because of the fact that dance is an intimate uh, performing art, um, they were able to perform with their partner or partners, but otherwise they were bubbled. So they didn't associate with people that were outside their bubble. And they had uh, facilities in New York and California. Uh, and if you do go online and check out the ABT incubator, you'll see some of the uh, new new pieces uh, that they're doing. It's, it's quite interesting, actually. Uh, there was a point made that in order for digital to succeed uh, at the company level, companies are going to have to make a serious commitment to digital. That means investing in the infrastructure that's necessary to keep it alive uh, technically. And they're going to have to invest in audience capture. They're going to have to promote and draw on audience segments that frankly, in the past, they, they may love ballet, they may love opera and dance, but they're not able to participate because, well, price is an issue. Ticket price is a big issue. And mobility is another issue. And they have found that, in fact, people in the rural communities that have interest uh, respond quite well to online, uh, online dance. But again, they emphasize the fact that their management is going to have to make some investments to keep it alive and well. Um, again, digital and live must exist together. Uh, performers talked about blended models, uh, meaning digital and live. Um, and they also talked a lot about the need for defining the possibilities of developing new business models. Um, for digital, for these blended models. And there are uh, a number of them talk about making um, arrangements or partnerships with educational institutions. For example, Skylar Brandt talked about um, collaboration with Harvard and talking to them about alternative ways of marketing and sales. I asked them questions about their personal thoughts, time alone, and so forth uh, during the COVID lockdown. And interestingly, they told me that more than ever, their time alone had shifted them into a frame of mind where they were talking or thinking about social issues and what was going on in the real world out there beyond dance. And as one dancer told me, at the uh, English National Ballet. She actually has it, uh, Natasha Mayer, and she actually has a t-shirt uh, that reflects their schedule. It says, eat, sleep, nutcracker, and then an arrow to the top, eat, sleep, nutcracker, and that's the life. And so I was told that time alone and time to reflect mm, suggested to them the overall importance of social issues and their need to uh, or their desire to participate more proactively going forward in advocacy uh, 
uh, with respect to the social issues. Uh, and just as a matter of fact, um, the issues that were number one and number two on the list, and it might have had something to do with the timing of the interviews, um, were Black Lives Matter and um, women's empowerment. Those were the top. Oh, and the third one uh, on part of the male dancers was the issue of um, perceived femininity uh, amongst male dancers. Um, you know, this idea that because you're a male dancer, you must be gay. And that's not true. It's actually quite diversified it's between those groups. Um, as far as audience outreach, uh, there was a perceived need on the part of the dancers to redefine their audience. Um, they, there was some cynicism about management-based programs, um, which were presented as outreach programs, but in fact, comments were made along the lines that they were covert ways of seeking donations from wealthy people. Um, there was a perceived lack of audience diversity and most of the dancers uh, were really committed to reaching out to a broader group of people uh, across age, across ethnicity, uh, across educational background. Uh, you slice it and dice it however you want. And uh, at least one dancer wanted to slice it and dice it uh, so that more people were interested and more people were involved. And I mean really involved, uh, giving feedback to the artists, uh, becoming involved in one way or another as living participants in uh, programs. Um, I found that particularly interesting. Um, and, you know, one thing that came across, and I, could, I couldn't help but miss it, there was often a sense of animosity between management and the performers. And maybe that's not surprising, but um, there are comments made about management and foundations having, in some cases, billions of dollars and being unwilling to fund or provide a safety net for any of the performing artists during the COVID. Um, and they felt as though they were being treated like tissue paper, uh, use them once and throw them away. Um, so in that spirit, it was said to me that there is a need going forward for performers and management to come to a common set of values and actually adhere to those values and manage and perform based on those values. Um, they did find, as I said, there was more time during the lockdown to reflect and look around and see what was going on in the world outside of dance. And they felt as though that was a healthy thing and they'd like to see it continue. That is to say, they would like to have more downtime to actually reflect on social issues, to be with family. Many of the dancers took the opportunity to go and see uh, family and meet newborn nieces and nephews and so forth. And they never had a chance to do that in the recent past. So that was something that they really came to value. Um, I did ask them how they felt about the industry or the, yeah, the industry's preparedness to respond to another crisis. And they were unequivocally, uh, unequivocally, they said that the industry is no more prepared to respond to a crisis now than it was before the COVID. And they attribute that um, to, they attribute that to management and management's focus on a very, very narrow group of supporters that they can depend upon largely financially to keep things moving forward. And as I said before, most of the performers indicated that if the industry continues in that direction, there are going to be ongoing troubles and some of them will be existential in the, in the sense that uh, some, companies, some companies will fail. Um, there were a number of artists that were willing to uh, solicit they wanted training in how to work with digital. Um, and I, I had a number of performers tell me that 
you know, they'd love to know how to work Instagram, but they don't really get it. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science here, but it's something that, and I appreciate it. And half the time, I don't know what I'm doing. I just hit buttons until something happens, uh, uh, which can be pathological, by the way. But um, they did express the need for uh, training uh, and how to perform. And this was a big issue for dancers because dancers are used to working in a three-dimensional environment and choreographers that I talked to express the same thing. It's really hard to work with a dancer or train with a dancer. And one of the dancers was actually training for uh, Swan Lake and she'd never performed it before. And she was doing it over Zoom with a trainer. And it was really tough because the three-dimensionality was gone. And you know, most of the leading ballet companies anyway provided artists with, uh, oh, they're essentially six by six sheets of linoleum that they were able to put down in their apartment and they could do pirouettes all day long. Uh, but one dancer told me that her coach was really after her for one pirouette or another. And she said she couldn't do it because every time she did it, she hit her teapot or slammed her leg against the cabinet or something like that. Uh, there's not a whole, you know, and just, you know, generally there's not a whole lot of room in a New York apartment uh, to, uh, you know, you don't try jetés around your living room. Uh, so there was a lot of concern about um, being able to practice um, and being supportive in working with experts to understand how to be more effective in a two-dimensional environment. Let me put it that way. Last, the last thing I'll show you is that this is a framework that I used with Aaron Williamon, who's the director of the Center for Performance Science at the Royal College of Music. And we actually used it initially as a self-assessment tool with uh, students at Royal College of Music. I've kind of tweaked it a little bit here and there so that I can use it with the dance community. And I used it not only in this interviewing process, but I've um, kind of migrated it over to uh, Trinity Laban and some of the dancers uh, that are um, getting ready to graduate this year. The axes are artistic. That means how did you feel about your artistic basic uh, capabilities as a consequence of the lockdown. Technical, how did you feel about your ability to exercise basic technical skills during the lockdown? Ensemble, how did you feel about your ability to work with others or your peer group? Learning, was learning effective during the lockdown? Uh, presentation, did you feel comfortable in your presentation skills uh, or a loss of your presentation skills during the lockdown owing to loneliness or being by yourself. Career, how did it impact your career path or your expectations for going forward? And last, uh, life, life refers to lifestyles. How did, how did it impact your health and well-being with respect to your general life, lifestyle? Here the, um, and PowerPoint kind of does funny things to color sometimes, but uh, let's say the orange are the musicians and the dark green are the dancers. Um, and if you think about how these axes play out, you can see that the dancers experienced more concern with respect to um, virtually all the axes. They're on a parody with respect with musicians with respect to life. Um, dancers were very concerned about the um, lifestyle and well-being. They were really concerned, and that in particular about their physical condition. And uh, there was one young one young dancer on the very junior end, but she's won um, the very top international awards. Um, she went back into the studio after a considerable layoff. And the first thing she did was go on point and um, broke a toe. So it was really quite devastating for her. And there were similar uh, stories. There was even a story in the New York Times 
Uh, I happened to talk to the person, but um, Sofia Coppola is directing a film using some of the dancers from New York City Ballet. And while they were very excited to get back into the studio and film this particular two minute segment, they were amazed because after about a minute and a half, they were completely out of breath. Uh, they started to cramp, um, lost a lot of their power, if you will. Um, so th this whole idea of lifestyle and uh, remaining in good physical condition was a, on, was a, it was a predominant or a pervasive concern amongst dancers. Um, the artistic abilities were a concern, and I think to some extent, artistic and ensemble overlapped because there were tales of, even in the case of the bubbles, where people had not danced together for a reasonable amount of time. And at least in the initial rehearsals, uh, they were way off with respect to each other's timing. They stumbled over each other, um, things they slipped, uh, things that you wouldn't normally expect from dancers at this level, but there were considerable problems getting back together and performing pas de deux and that kind of thing. Um, learning, as I indicated, was a problem. Online learning was not particularly successful. Um, musicians weren't as concerned about it uh, because a lot of the musicians have played, you know, Beethoven's Fifth 500 times, and there's not much more they can do with it. Um, whereas dancers felt the need for ongoing coaching and training more so than the musicians. Presentation, this one really surprised me. There was a lot of anxiety, particularly amongst the dancers with respect to presentation. And what surprised me about their anxiety toward presentation was most of these dancers, on average, the people that I interviewed, the average age of start was four and a half years old. So they'd been out there for a long time. And yet they were experiencing anxiety about that first performance when they go back. What are people going to think of me? Uh, in a sense of humility and a sense of anxiety over, over their abilities. Career, as I said, career is a big issue, particularly for the dancers, because their time is extremely limited uh, with respect to their overall career path. And as I said, some dancers... Um, at the upper end of the age bracket will not return to their companies because of age and other dancers at the younger end um, will not return because they've been diverted into um, other areas of other areas of the life cycle uh, being unable to dance at a sufficiently high level. Um, I think that I guess one other point is on lifestyle. Um, Musicians were really less concerned about eating habits and that kind of thing. You know, a couple pizzas a week didn't really phase them too much. Dancers, that phased them a lot. And I asked him, I said, you know, do you, do you have any trouble or any cravings for donuts and things like that? And um, he said, no, you know, we've been eating kiwi fruit and toast since we were little kids. So it's a matter of habit. <laughs> and... Uh, Musicians, on the other hand, weren't so worried about that. I guess you can eat whatever and still play the trumpet. Uh, so basically, that's where I came out on this as respect to comparing the two. Uh, and I think it's, I, I'm still reflecting on the comparison. I don't have a definitive answer as to the two areas. Uh, and it's a part of the research that I want to continue and understand. I'm trying to understand dance and music where they meet, where they don't meet, and looking at it in terms of interpretation, expression, and emotional engagement with audiences. And, you know, I think it's probably gonna take me the rest of my life to figure anything out. But, uh, but that's the direction in which I'm going in this artist profiling as part of it. Well, um, now since uh, we've talked uh, about the production side of the, uh, of the online uh, music, uh, I would like to talk about consumption side. So the, the, the users, the, the fans who are on the, um, 
on the other end of uh, of this. So as we have uh, seen with uh, many um, many uh, presentations today, and with Phil as well, that uh, social distancing has uh, brought. Uh, the implications that uh, there's a reduction in face-to-face -face contacts, um, increased well, physical distance, different levels of uh, quarantine everywhere. And as a result, cancellation of um, uh, activities such as sport or music. And since music is an inherently uh, social activity, the challenge for the musicians is uh, to stay connected with their audiences and uh, well, for, the, uh, for the audiences as well, who people who are used to... Um, have music um, as a big part of their lives they have been uh, uh, faced with um, uh, no opportunity to to practice it to 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 visit any concerts and so uh, portal shows uh, um, which is a term used uh, to to address all of the live streams podcasts online forums uh, webinars online concerts online um, uh, courses um, so portal shows uh, have uh, accelerated uh, the entrance uh, to the to the digital uh, our digitalized world uh, it's not that they are new uh, they have already existed prior uh, pandemic but with the but pandemic has accelerated this trend and um, um, so for example during the pandemic uh, um, as you can see the citation here uh, an opinion was expressed that in creative industries uh, dematerialization uh, uh, on production side and uh, immaterialization on consumption side should be embraced to ensure the industry's survival mm -hmm. under the pandemic related restrictions um, the question here is um, the one that we've uh, we've asked ourselves with phil um, is whether this uh, new norm that um, everybody is, um, is talking about is irreversible and whether it's uh, really accepted by the consumers uh, and desired by the consumers and whether it's likely to stay in fact beyond the pandemic. So um, in order to address uh, this question, we focused on um, uh, on understanding the motives for the continued consumption of online music um, live events. Um, in um, ICT uh, literature, uh, it's um, continuous, uh, continuous um, intention to consume um, different technology and different media uh, appears as an important indicator of the user's well, willingness to, uh, to go beyond the adoption of certain technology. So it's the post-adoption that we are interested in. So here we're interested in the post um, adoption of this online uh, music events, whether it will continue um, in the future beyond the pandemic and uh, what is the customers, uh, what customers, fans, uh, users opinion on this. So to address this, we have um, uh, used the users and gratification theory that I will briefly uh, talk about and the, uh, the the concepts of loneliness and depression that uh, uh, came out as the uh, pandemic related uh, well, consequences for uh, well, for everyone and for the uh, consumers uh, of music uh, as well so um from the perspective of uh, the historical development of um, of, of, of music and uh, music consumption live shows has been the traditional mode of music consumption then the recordings uh, recording industry um, um, brought uh, music into people's uh, homes and uh, and workplaces and uh, and pretty much everywhere then with the streaming um, the distribution of music have been overturned uh, completely and changed again the habits of uh, consumption but uh, live shows still um, uh, still are uh, popular because uh, that's this multi-sensual and uh, authentic experience that uh, only that that can only be brought to uh, to the fans by this face-to-face uh, face-to-face uh, -face concerts live shows offer um, part of the, well part of social relationships with the artists um, that, that can be maintained better through live shows and uh, also the ability to perform fans identity which means that fans participate also during the live shows they sing they dance they uh, well they they move uh, their heads and they they um, uh, well they express also their their own identity during the the shows so uh, with regards to the digitalization of uh, the venues, um, 
there was a mixed evidence on uh, on the acceptance of uh, digitalization of venues by uh, by uh, by users by fans while some are really reluctant and uh, prefer to to really to participate in the live events some find that uh, indeed it can be an alternative um, alternative way on, of consuming music because in a way um, it also uh, online um, online events also allow um, main in this parasocial relationships with the artists and also in a way allow um, performing fans identities the way that they organize there is the so-called entry into the uh, into the digital venue uh, then uh, there is the countdown before the event uh, then there is also a, a chat box where the, the fans can exchange their opinions um, they can also send different messages during the show they can well, well, cite uh, uh, cite songs the lyrics of the songs so there are ways uh, of um, engagement with the artists there are ways um, of engagement uh, with each other if we're talking about the online shows that are uh, more well, that are smaller and that are more intimate then again um, fans can even have the opportunity to move from parasocial relationships which are one way from the artist to uh, the fans to most social relationships if uh, the artist will engage with them and will actually actually answer to them and react on their comments so uh, so there is this um, this potential for this online uh, venues and uh, we were interested to uh, to figure out uh, basically will this online music consumption stay in the post pandemic and what can be the drivers of this and whether the pandemic factors um, would would drive this uh, this consumption um, so uh, for the continuous behavior just for the sake of the of the um, definition so it's the decision of a user to continue using a particular uh, information communication technology for a longer period of time in our case we refer to the intention to consume uh, live music events via online portals in the future so beyond the the pandemic so we are using uh, this um, users and gratification uh, theory, uh, which is a motivational paradigm that uh, that is um, arising from the media and consumption research and focuses on understanding um, users' motives for um, information acquisition via different social media, uh, via specific media. Um, in relation to music, um, well, while gratifications or basically the the, the satisfact satisfaction uh, received from um, different technology vary from um, utility to pleasure to um, prestige uh, um, acquiring to socialization what is more related to music are uh, hedonic and social gratifications so um, hedonic relates to the enjoyment and pleasure that uh, a user receives from the music and social relates to the opportunity to connect with the others so we were interested uh, to know whether these two uh, motives would actually um, lead to the continuous uh, intention of the fans to uh, to to attend if we can say that uh, online music events and on the other hand um so going back to the uh, to the pandemic related um, side effects social distancing has um, has led to um to 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 uh, to negative uh, emotional experiences known as the deterioration of social belonging where people um don't uh, well, don't don't feel themselves anymore a part of the community so that they have this restricted um ability to connect with uh, with with others and um as a result it's disrupting their social identity and they're experiencing what's called in the literature also social pain uh, which um, which is this damage uh, to to ones uh, to oneself um, because of the lack of the social connection and social value and since music is inherently social activity um, the idea is that maybe social uh, the social belonging uh, might be somehow restored uh, through engagement also into uh, music consumption and well online in this case under the pandemic so for the loneliness uh well here's the de definition of loneliness uh in here and um so since loneliness um implies also dissatisfaction um 
of the individuals with their uh, current state, they might use these different compensation strategies um, that can act as a surrogate, a surrogate for social interaction. So, for example, online uh, online strategies. Depression that is uh, another uh, another effect uh, of uh, the um, uh, pandemic and uh, linked to the loneliness. Um, uh, also uh, causes distress, depressive moods, anguish, and uh, also uh, we we, uh, we hypothesize that uh, both loneliness and depression could potentially drive um, consumers and fans to search uh, to compensate for for their state and therefore to 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 search how they can relieve their social pain and restore parasocial relationships with the artists. So we wanted to see if this will be the, also the causes of um, uh, the intention to consume online music. Uh, we also thought that loneliness and depression can also moderate the relationships between the, um, the gratifications and the, and the continuous intention. So here are the different lists of hypotheses we have tested. Probably it's better seen here. So as you can see, that was our model. So with the continuous intention to consume uh, music life um, events uh, as a dependent variable and um, uh, gratifications and perceived loneliness and perceived depression as uh, independent ones and the moderating effects of perceived loneliness and perceived depression. We've used quantitative uh, methodology. The research was uh, exploratory. We haven't uh, got um, a very big sample. So um, definitely in the future, we'll continue the research. So there, was, uh, there were 108 responses. And uh, well, our, our, our focus was on this uh, several um, so several concepts that uh, I have introduced. We use structural equation modeling and partial least squares um, via smart PLS. Uh, so these are our results. Uh, both uh, types of gratification seem to explain the continuous intention. So basically, it means that predominantly people uh, people will continue attend online online uh, live events if they enjoy music so enjoyment and pleasure is the dominant uh, is the dominant um, motive for people to continue to consume music uh, social gratifications that is uh, another blue line but um, a little bit narrow than, than from hedonic gratifications to their continuous intention um, also is not insignificant but less um, uh, less uh, less significant than the, the enjoyment that people get from music, which basically means that predominantly music listening would be motivated by intrinsic factors, by own uh, liking of music, uh, rather than the desire to socialize. Um, with regards to loneliness and uh, perceived loneliness and perceived depression, they uh, in our list model here they have uh, they've been found to have no direct effect on the continuous intention to consume online events. Um, again, this can be probably explained that um, uh, whether you're feeling lonely and and depressed, that's not going to be the motivator for someone who is not into music originally to start suddenly consuming music. So the dominant factor would be still um, liking uh, of uh, of the music and enjoy, enjoyment from the music to start doing it. Nevertheless, uh, perceived depression has been found to affect the strength of the impact of um, enjoyment or um, or, or uh, social uh, gratifications on the continuous intention to um, to consume music. So um, as you can see, there's this uh, little da dashed lines from perceived uh, depression to hedonic gratifications, it comes with the um, uh, negative uh, negative value, which means that when people feel uh, depressed, uh, they will extract less pleasure from, con from consuming online uh, music. So they will be less motivated uh, to consume music. Uh, they will have, well, generally, I guess, when people are depressed, they have less pleasure from everything. So music is not going to be an exception here. So they will have uh, much less pleasure when they are um, when they feel depressed. At the same time, when people feel depressed, that's the second dashed line here. It comes with a positive sign, um, so um, with a positive value. So uh, when people feel uh, depressed, uh, they will have more um, social gratification from uh, consuming online event. So probably again, it can be explained that 
uh, while not particularly enjoying life and music, people will still try to compensate for their state and search for social um, connection with others. And therefore, uh, the social element would become more attractive for them when uh, if they are consuming uh, music uh, online. So that what, that's pretty much our um, our our tables that um, specify the details of the of the of the research. So, so demographic factors. That's the tables confirming that our validity measurements uh, were in line with uh, foreigner and uh, worker scales, and uh, that's the path that you have just seen on them. Um, on the on the graph uh, specified which hypothesis was supported and which were not. So uh, yes, I've pretty much already mentioned all the important results. So that's just the summary. So the most important result is that it's the enjoyment that guides um, continuous intention to consume online events. Um, social gratifications are of secondary importance, but cannot com cannot completely be ignored. Um, and um, the impact, uh, no direct impact of perceived loneliness and perceived depression, but um, uh, but the uh, the moderating effects of uh, perceived depression on uh, both gratification types, as we have discussed. So, what what the what, what implications can we draw from this? Um, well, it's probably the most important is that it's uh, it's that our artists and organizers should be guided by their target audiences um, and by their preferences and built the, um, the, the experience with the emphasis on the pleasure that music itself can provide. Um, and um, also the significance of the social gratifications probably is an additional venue uh, to explore uh, how can um, artists um, think about creation of uh, uh, socialization opportunities during an online, uh, online uh, event. For example, um, probably there is an important implication for the whole um, uh, IT research. Uh, we are all talking about uh, digitalization and uh, this new normal where everything is going to be much more online um, than, than before. Well, from our research, it is uh, what we have got that it's not because of the pandemic. So it's not because of loneliness or depression that we will suddenly start um, engaging in the consumption of something online if previously we were not uh, into this if it was not not our specific well interest or leisure, so maybe it's not uh, that much about yeah extrinsic factors or bringing things online, but um, about um, people's uh, um, well, own uh, motives that are guided by uh, their uh, their uh, enjoyment. Uh, with regards to limitations and the poss possible future research uh, mm, uh, for us, of course, we need to expand the sample size to have more answers to see uh, how our model behaves and uh, with, um, with a bigger sample. Uh, we haven't found any significant social demographic effects, and that could be also an interesting um, path to explore, for example, how different people react um, to uh, to different music uh, styles, uh, is there any difference between uh, what kind of music event is uh, is is being uh, performed? Um, is there any difference between um, the the gratifications that people receive when they have different levels of musical training? Uh, for example, amateurs in, in music or professionals in music, do they have the same um, motives for um, for attending online events or not? So these are uh, the possible venues to explore. And of course, we haven't touched at all uh, the economic uh, aspect of, uh, of, uh, of, of this um, uh, concert. So that would be the whole separate uh, path to explore what are these economic opportunities offered by online live music events and, uh, and how this can be, uh, yeah, how they can be, um, how this new business models can, uh, can, uh, can, can appear. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there are people who want to uh, ask questions in this room. There might be people also online whom I can allow to talk if they want to intervene directly uh, with remarks, comments, or uh, questions. So maybe let's start with the room. Is there anyone here in French or English? I'm hearing there's a necessity for a new business model. Um, 
within the dance industry, I'm mm -hmm. talking especially. Uh, but how how adaptable do you think these big companies really are? From the feedback that I have had, um, the management structures are not particularly adaptable, and the management structures hold the cash drawer. Uh, so it, it's an uphill battle, and that was made very clear to me. Um, so the, to, adaptability is a good, is a big issue, and that's a good point. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Ada, do you see anyone in the chat? No. One quick comment that I'll make, um, which in a way refers to adaptability. Um, I found it really, really interesting. You know, I'm a newbie when it comes to dance. I've been in music for a long time, but I'm being taught. Um, and I asked dancers and musicians how often they communicated with one another. And the answer was zero. Uh, in fact, <laughs> a couple of dancers um, that performed at Lincoln Center told me that, uh, yeah, they talk once in a while over a sandwich steps at Lincoln Center. But other than that, there's no collaboration. One of the bright sides of the COVID pandemic is that uh, I only know it from the side of the New York City Ballet, but there are actually people in the orchestra that are starting to collaborate independently with the dancers and Olivia Boisson and um, um, oh, Kaya, and I won't try her last name because it's a Polish name and it's tough, but her, it's a hyphenated name that ends with Weiss. And um, they have a great video that they did. Uh, and the deal is that the dancer gets to choose the choreography and the musicians get to choose the music and no director's gonna tell them what to do. And they just kind of see what comes out of it. And it's really, it's fun. I've been in on some of the Zoom meetings from the bottom up and it's really fun to see how they work together and they communicate or don't. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's been a great learning experience for me. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, you, you presented material with interviews and, and your research material is based in the US. Is, is that right? My, yes. No, not all of it by any means. Um, I did a number of interviews um across europe including england lithuania oh okay. um yeah it was I how, how about paris and france <laughs> um it's not for lack of trying <laughs> the peri opera ballet chose not to participate uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. there you go uh -huh. we're not in the same model for for performing artists in france because we have the intermittents yeah. It's not the same That's situation. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's not the same social protection as as for the other uh, countries you're talking about. Yeah, I think also, and I, you know, I can compare it with Russia. I did some interviews in Russia and so forth. There was on the part of performers, and I tried to get to people in the court of ballet up to the principals, and it was almost as if they were told not to speak to the public. You got a strong sense of a gag order. <laughs> I have a little question. Thank you so much, both of you, for your uh, research. I was wondering about um, this blended model you're proposing, or that was proposed by performing artists, the need to keep the, the to have the best of both worlds, in a way, to have the physical and the digital. And I was thinking about the, we were interviewing the head of audience in our class the other day. And he was talking about the importance of consumer knowledge, the importance of getting all of the, we have so much knowledge about how people consume culture today. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering, um, uh, this best model, which would be being able to be there live when you can, but also being able to find your public all over the world who wants to connect into that and take advantage of the streaming. And what, what are your thoughts about that? I think technology will take us in the direction of finding a broader swath of audience. Some of it is going always going to be limited. For example, the idea of wearing virtual um, uh, virtual vision goggles and that kind of thing. I don't think you're going to get people out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> that are 80 and 90 years old to put on goggles. They're expensive and they're a little bit intimidating, but 
there is hope for doing that for sure. The big issue, I think the big issue is not the technology side. The big issue seems to be how to monetize it. Okay, because you can go online now if you contribute a very small amount to American Valley Theater and you can see the latest and greatest performance for a very small amount, maybe 10 euros or something like that. Um, but 10 euros isn't going to cover the cost of operating an international ballet company. So there is an issue about, okay, technology is great, digital is great. How do we monetize it to stay alive? We have another question online. And the question is from Zyra. And she's asking why have academies not adapted to the online environment faster? And what do you think they should undertake and implement into their study program to motivate their students more efficiently during COVID? Best regards. Yeah. Here's, the, here's the question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Why have academics, um, academies, academies not adapted to the online environment faster? Did you think you should undertake, they should undertake to implement? Yeah, and I think there is an awareness on part on the part of some faculty members in conservatories where I've uh, had experience. Uh, I'm a product of Berkeley College of Music, for example, and there is an innovation group at Berkeley that's quite aggressive with respect to uh, new technology, and you know they work with the digital audio workstations and Ableton Live and Max Eight and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so there, there is a knowledge that in that sector. When you go to the more proper conservatories, uh, like the Royal College of Music or the uh, Royal Academy of Music. The departments are divided up into groups that are very, they're traditional groups. You expect to see a musicology group and you expect to see a performance group subdivided by instrument and so forth. And I think, again, on the part of some, there's acknowledgement that this, uh, this business of technology is important. It should be introduced as part of, part of the curriculum. But on the other hand, you know, when I talk to some of the students, they kind of look at me cross-eyed when they talk about technology and they'd really, and I'm being serious about this, they would rather practice trills for eight hours a day than worry about digital technology. You know? <laughs> and so some of that has to do with the fact they're going into a very competitive environment and they have, you know, their expectations are that the London Symphony will hire them at that level. So it's tough, but it's coming. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a short break and resume at three here with uh, the largest group of this conference, Trans Digital. I just wanted to add um, uh, thanks to a person who's here in the room, Cynthia Cervantes, my colleague at IESA, um, for her questions, her participation, but also because she planted the seed for this conference. Uh, when we were thinking about having a conference on the impact of COVID, she said to me, uh, well, uh, digital transformations uh, are, are, are the scene now. This is what's, what's happening, has been happening, but it's, it's even uh, more rampant today. And from there, I went on and organized this conference. So thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's see each other at three.